And this is for George. Because <laughs> sometimes a dive bar can be a single wide trailer in Greenville, Tennessee. <laughs> this is a Greenville Midget Thug Smackdown 2005 baby. No shit, he had Thug Life tattooed on the back of his neck. He was a white boy, shaved head, wife beater, jeans around his ass. And my first thought was, yeah, right. I tried to calm the redneck inside of me. That's right. I got a redneck. A redneck inside of me. Bukowski had a bluebird. I've got a redneck. I try to keep him down most of the time I can. Sometimes I gotta take a two by four up to the side of his head to get the job done, but I get the job done. We were all drinking. They had this midget running around. She was kind of pretty and funny and not in a midget way, but in like a regular way. And this thug, he kept, you know, like trying to put the moves on her, but he had a woman. She was sitting on the couch next to me. She'd watch her thug talking dirty to this midget, and she wouldn't say nothing. She'd just look and drink. It was making me mad. I was pretty drunk. I tried to calm the redneck inside of me. I went back to talking about literature and popular culture and music and other things. I tried to listen to Mama. She always told me not to be fighting people because I'm so much bigger than everyone else. But it's hard to hear your mama when you're drinking. And the thug and the midget were wrestling on the floor, and it wasn't like innocent, it was like of a sexual nature. And hell, I was pretty drunk. And the thug's woman got up and she said something to him, and he jumped up and said, he didn't do nothing. He said that it was all her, meaning the midget. And the midget started crying because I guess she thought the thug really liked her. And it was starting to get a little crazy in there. And Tracy, this guy's trailer we were in, he's looking around like he don't know what to do. And the thug's woman, she stomps off out the door. The thug goes after her saying, baby, baby, baby. And the midget comes up and pushes the thug and calls him an asshole. And she's all crying and everything. And hell, I was pretty drunk. And the thug picks her up and throws her across the room. She hits the floor pretty hard, and then, well, the redneck inside of me had had just about as much of that as he could stand, and I jumped up and said, all right, I'm about to kill this motherfucker. And I went after him, he saw me, and he started running, I chased him, but Tracy, who's bigger even than me, caught him from behind, had him in a half Nelson. <laughs> When the thug saw this, he stopped and turned and got all tough, throwing his arms around front and all that horse shit, grabbing his nuts and dancing around, saying, come on, come on, come on. But he's standing about four feet away from me, and I'm trying to get loose from Tracy, and some of the girls there are consoling the midget, and some of them are consoling the thug's woman, and hell, I was pretty drunk, and I don't know what happened after that, but Tracy must have got me calmed down. Somewhere or another, Somewhere or another, everything got calm. And Tracy made the thug and his woman leave, and they were leaving, and it was one of those awkward silences, and they were telling everyone goodbye, and then he came to me and held his hand up all cool-like and said, it's all good now, right, dog? I said, yeah, it's all right. And I thought the redneck in me was passed out, you know, but. He can be a sneaky son of a bitch sometimes. And as the thug was walking away, I said, uh, you piece of shit. <laughs> and then round two started with him running to his car, me chasing him, Tracy trying to drag me away by the hem of my shirt. The thug and his woman got in their car about the time my shirt ripped off. I was up there kicking at their car and screaming and spitting, but they drove off. Left me standing there in the middle of the road in Greenville, Tennessee in the middle of the night with no shirt and I'll admit I felt a little like a fool but hell I was pretty drunk <laughs> 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 
It is raining hard. The parking lot is awash with motor oil and debris, drowned cigarette butts and condom wrappers, beer bottle caps and matchbooks. The, the rain brings these things to life, pulls them out of the ground and floats them out into the open. I come out of the darkness somewhere and into the rain, my boots sloshing heavily on the saturated asphalt, splashing through puddles and rainbow colored water. The rain hitting me cold and hard, plastering my hair to my forehead, making my clothes feel a thousand times heavier. Everyone is wet inside the bar. We were all caught in this storm and sought refuge in the one place where we knew we were sure to find it. In fact, it didn't take a rainstorm to bring us here. Most of us were heading here in the first place. It is Saturday night, and these are all people that I know, men mostly. There are only two women here. The bartender is Joe, the owner, and she is old and fierce and won't put up with any shit, but she will hold your hand while you cry and will sometimes brush a lock of wet hair from your forehead and listen as you curse God and the world. The other woman here is Mary. She works the corner of Cherokee Avenue and Sullivan Street. She'll suck your dick for $10 and for $20 you can fuck her. She's pretty old too, with skin on her face that looks like cured leather, and she's missing three teeth. She's a little fat around the middle, but she has an ass that won't quit. Her jeans are always tied around her butt. She looks like she's been poured into them. The rest of us are men. We are not children of the night. We are the vanquished, ruined men of the night. We have bad teeth, bad skin, and gimpy limbs. We have pot bellies and bad backs. We are tattooed and scarred. We have bad livers and broken hearts. We are balding and bleeding from orifices seen and unseen. We are alcoholics and drug addicts. And this night we are all wet. There's Larry, maybe my best friend there. He is 60 or so. He has long white hair that falls all around him and looks cool when he washes it. He doesn't have any teeth. He cries whenever he talks about a place called fucking Vietnam. There is Joe, little Joe we call him because his legs are like these little flippers and he keeps them folded under him in his little electric wheelchair. His hands are curled up like talons, almost useless, but he has this thumb and he's managed to crawl through life by using his middle finger and his thumb, which he can use with an with a ad, admirable amount of it, dexterity. And there's Malcolm, a, a serious drunk. I, I mean a drunk who goes on binges for weeks at a time, who was born in England and bears this fact ever before him. He is sad most of the time, and once he starts talking about his father, he will not stop until he passes out. There's Bill, who used to be a singer in a bluegrass band, but now he has a hole in his throat, and he speaks through one of those voice boxes that makes him sound like a robot. There's whacked out crackhead Eddie, who doesn't have too many brain cells left, who just sits in the corner and stares off into space. He only talks to people he likes. He talks to me sometimes. There are others here and the jukebox is playing a song by Lucinda Williams, song to a poet. We are smoking and drinking at the bar. We are playing darts. We are shooting pool. We are telling dirty jokes. Some are doing drugs in the bathroom, but all I ever needed was alcohol. We do our things and when the door opens, we all look hoping to see that woman come in, the one we have all been waiting for. We are desperate and destitute. We are poets without words. We, like everyone else, and maybe even more so, are looking for love. To just once be called baby without having to pay for it. To hold hands with someone in the park. To have someone to buy flowers for. To have someone to fall asleep with. To be able to do all the things people write love songs about. We come here and we sit and we watch the door. 
I'm on my fourth rum and coke and Mary comes up behind me and runs her finger along my shoulder, stopping briefly at my neck and then her fingers travel to the other shoulder and then drift away. But I've never needed her before, so she walks to the corner and sits smoking cigarettes and drinking Old Crow straight up. <laughs> the door opens and all of the sad, defeated eyes in the room turn to, uh, turn to look. Coming out of the rain, just like in a movie, is a beautiful lady. She is wearing a blue dress. She is tall and round in just the right places. She has long brown hair and a fine, soft face and big brown eyes. She is holding an umbrella above her and she is dry. She closes the umbrella, shakes it off in the corner and surveys the room. The wide staring eyes feasting upon her. The sad, ruined face is silent. They're upon her instantly like lepers crawling towards Christ. They scoot over, offer her seats, offer to take her umbrella and coat. She sits at the bar. She orders a glass of wine. The only wine Joe has behind the bar is Fabrizia in a box, but it is wine. They're gathered around her each in turn and sometimes overlapping each other, vying for her attention. She pulls a cigarette out of her purse, searches for a lighter, but... A dozen fingers with dirty fingernails hold out scuffed lighters and matches up for her. She smiles and lights the cigarette on one of them. I know what she's doing. She, she likes this attention. She's, she's a good looking woman, but she doesn't, but she wouldn't stand out in some trendy bar like she does here in this place. She would be just any of dozens of other good looking women. Coming in places like these makes her feel good, but she is not going to love any of these men. She's never going to call any of them baby. I know this, and I suspect that they know it too, but still they clamor over each other, trying to get her to notice them. She will leave soon, and some of these men will think that they might have had a chance with her. Some of them will misinterpret the smile she gave them. Some of them will go home and think about her and hope that she will come back to the bar tomorrow. Some of them will think of how her hand brushed against their arm and convince themselves that it was done on purpose. Some of them will want to write poems to her, but they will not have the words to do it, so they will close their eyes and masturbate alone in the darkness and see her face in their minds. They will memorialize her there with all the sad things, build a shrine to her in their minds, keep her there until the door opens again. I nod at Joe, I tell her I'm ready to pay my tab. She tells me I owe $13. I have a five, a 10, and a 20 in my wallet folded in amongst the scraps of paper there. I hand her the 10 and the five, and then I go to look for Mary. <laughs>